The Lion and the Wolf If anyone asked, he'd always say he loved the ladies, the chase, the conquest, the bawdy jokes. But the truth was, Leo had never been comfortable around women. Men made sense. Slapped backs and firm shakes and blunt talk and wrestling. But women were a bloody mystery. He never quite knew what to make of their chatter and their feelings and their strange soft bodies. Tits. Men talked a lot about tits. So Leo did too. Nudge in the ribs, look at the cargo she's carrying. But if he was entirely honest, he didn't really understand the appeal. To Leo, tits were just there. He'd get the job done in bed, of course. He'd lead the bloody charge. No problems in that department. But some of the most awkward moments of his life had been mornings after. He reached for his trousers, picked some straw out of them, painstakingly pulled them on, wincing as his belt buckle clinked. He fished up his shirt and his boots, took a step towards the chink of light down the edge of the door, and looked back. Ricker lay in the hay, arms flung heedlessly wide, gold ring through her nose gleaming with the morning light, tangled mass of chains and runes and talismans shifting as she breathed, a stray strand of hair across her face. In spite of his headache, he found he was smiling. Leo had never been comfortable around women, but perhaps his problem had been finding the right one. Ricker was nothing like the ladies his mother would manoeuvre into his path in Ostenholm. They always seemed to say one thing but mean another, like talking was a game you won by making the other player totally confused. Ricker had known him for years. There was no need for fumbling small talk, and every moment with her felt like an adventure. She could kidnap a conversation and in a breath carry it off into strange territory. You never knew where you'd end up, but it was always honest. He tossed his boots away and slipped down beside her again. He lifted his hand, paused a moment then, grinning all the while, gently pushed that strand of hair off her face. Her eyes didn't open, but her mouth curled into a smile. Decided not to slink away after all. Realized there's nowhere I'd rather be. It gave him an odd little shiver when she opened those big grey eyes and looked at him. Fancy another go around, eh? And she stretched out, arms over her head, wriggling back into the straw. No word from the king yet, he said, leaning close to kiss her. She pulled her chin away from him. And the lady governor? Nothing in writing, he murmured. So I'm taking it they approve. Her breath was sour, her lips scummy at the corners, and he didn't care. She slid a hand into his hair, gripped him hard, and kissed him deep. Hungry, tonguey kisses that left nothing to the imagination. She rolled him over, getting up onto one elbow, biting at her lip as she started undoing his belt, and he squirmed back into the hay, breath coming fast again, headache forgotten. She stopped, frowning, pushed herself up to sitting, wrinkling her nose. Can you smell that? They keep animals in here. No. Smells sweet. Smells like... Ricker sniffed, wafting air at her nose. Her little finger was twitching. Oh, no. Her face fell as she stared at it. Always the worst times. All her fingers were twitching now. Get it, sir, and it fail. And she dropped back in the straw, her whole arm shaking. What? Get Isern! Ricker grabbed the dowel on its thong around her neck and bit down hard on it. Next moment she arched back like a full-drawn bow. She made a great long hollow wheeze, as if all the breath was being squeezed out of her. Then she dropped, hay flying as she writhed, muscles madly jerking, kicking heels hacking at the dirt floor. Shit! squeaked Leo, one arm out towards her, the other out towards the door, wanting to hold her down so she didn't smash herself, wanting to help her and not knowing how. His first thought, much to his dismay, was to run for his mother. His second was to do as he'd been told and get Isernifail. 
he flung the door open and charged across the yard, chickens scattering between tents, past men picking at their breakfast, sharpening their weapons, moaning at the wet and the food and the state of things, staring at him as he dashed by half-naked. He saw Glaward sitting by a fire, grinning, as Durand whispered something in his ear. They both spun wide-eyed as Leo pounded up, then broke apart, and he sprang between them over the flames, knocking a pot of water bouncing away. Sorry! He nearly fell as his bare foot slid on the other side, tottered a few steps, and was charging on through the Northman's campsite, smoky fires and the smell of cooking, and someone singing in a rumbling bass as he pissed into the trees. Where's Isan Ifail? he screeched. Isan Ifail! He followed a pointed hand towards a tent, hardly even knowing whose hand it was, lashed at the flap and ripped his way through. He'd half expected to find her bent over a cauldron, but the hillwoman was sitting in her tent in a tattered Gurkish dressing gown, her bandaged leg propped on an old crate, a smoking chagger pipe in one hand and a jug of last night's ale in the other. She glanced at him as he tried to catch his breath. I rarely turn down a half-naked man first thing in the morning, but— She's having a fit, he wheezed out. Isern dropped the pipe in the jug with a hiss, hauled her injured leg off the crate, and stiffly stood. Show me! There she lay, not thrashing like she had been, but still squirming and making that wheezing moan, spit around the dowel turned to froth and flecked across her twisted face. She must have caught her head against the wall. There was blood in her hair. Boy, the dead, grunted Isern, kneeling beside her and putting a hand on her shoulder. Help me hold her, then. And Leo knelt too, one hand on Ricker's arm and one on her knee, while Isern rooted through her hair to look at the cut. It was then he realized Ricker was stark naked, and he wasn't far off. We were just... Maybe Antalp could have pulled out an innocent explanation. He'd had the practice. But Leo had never been much of a liar, and this needed a true master of the art. We were just... I am a woman of the world. Isser Nifail didn't even bother to look at him. I can hazard a mad guess at what you were about, boy. She leaned down over Ricker, wiping the froth away with her fingers, smoothing her hair back from her face. Shh she breathed, sang it almost. <laughs> ever so gently she held her, ever so softly she spoke, more gently and more softly than Leo would have thought that hard-faced hillwoman could have. Come back, Ricker, come on back. Ricker gave a feeble grunt, a last flurry of twitches running through her legs and up to her shoulders. She groaned, slowly pushed the spitty dowel out of her mouth with her tongue. Fuck, she croaked. There's my girl, said Isern, the edge back on her voice. Leo closed his eyes and gave a sigh of relief. She was all right, and he realized he was still gripping her tight, even though she'd stopped jerking, and he let go quickly, saw the marks of his fingers pink on her arm. Isern was already working Ricker's trousers over her limp feet and up her legs. Help me get her dressed. Not sure I know. Got her undressed, didn't you? Same thing, you see, but in reverse. Ricker gave a long groan as she slowly sat up, clutching at her bloody head. What did you see? asked Isern, wrapping Ricker's shirt around her shoulders and squatting beside her. I saw a bald weaver with a purse that never emptied. Ricker's voice sounded strange, rough, hollow, not like her voice at all. It made Leo feel a little afraid somehow, and a little excited. What else? asked Isern. I saw an old woman whose head was stitched together with golden wire. Huh? What else? I saw a lion and a wolf fight in a circle of blood. They fought tooth and claw, and the wolf had the best of it. She stared up at Leo the wolf had the best of it, but the lion was the winner. She caught him by the hand, staring into his face, dragging him close with a shocking strength. The lion was the winner. 
Till that moment, Leo had been sure it was all guff. The long eye. Old tales and superstitions. What else could it be? But looking into Ricker's wild, wet eyes, pupils swollen up so big there was no iris left at all, but only black pits with no bottom, he felt the hairs on his neck rise and the skin on his spine tingle. Suddenly he began to doubt. Or maybe he began to believe. Am I the lion? he whispered. But she'd closed her eyes, sagged back in the straw, her limp hand dropping from his. Out you go now, boy, said Isern, shoving his boots and his shirt into his arms. Am I the lion? he called again, for some reason desperate to know. Lion? Isern laughed as she pushed him out into the yard. Ass, maybe. And she kicked the door shut. No Unnecessary Sentiment My father thinks very highly of you. Inquisitor Teufel's permanently narrowed eyes swiveled from the sunny country slipping past the window to Savine, but she said nothing. To have called her hard-looking would have been an epic understatement. She appeared to be chiseled from flint. Her chin and cheekbones jutted. Her nose was blunt and slightly bent, with two marked creases above the bridge from constant frowning. Her dark hair was shot with grey and bound back tightly as a murderer's shackles. Sabine flashed her artfully constructed, artless smile, the one people usually could not help returning. And he's not a man who gives praise lightly. Teufel acknowledged that with the faintest nod, but kept her silence. Compliments can coax more from some people than torture, and Savine had found compliments relayed from some respected third party most effective of all. But Teufel's locks were not so easily picked. She swayed faintly with the jolting of the carriage, face as guarded as a bank vault. Savine could not help shifting at a sudden pang. With impeccable timing, her menses were starting early the familiar dull ache through her belly and down the backs of her thighs, with an occasional sharp twinge into her arse by way of light relief. As usual, she struggled with every muscle to look perfectly relaxed, and forced her grimace into an ever brighter smile. He tells me you were raised in England, she said, trying a different tack. Finally, Teufel spoke, but only the minimum. I was, my lady. She reminded Savine of one of Kernsbick's engines, stripped back, angular, and unapologetic. No unnecessary flesh, no unnecessary ornament, and for damn sure, no unnecessary sentiment. You worked in a coal mine? I did, and had not changed her clothes since, by the look of it. A worn shirt with sleeves rolled up to the elbows, and those leather braces workmen wear coarse trousers tucked into tightly laced work boots, one of which was thrust defiantly out into the centre of the carriage floor as if staking a claim to the territory, scarcely a gesture towards femininity anywhere. Had there ever been a woman who took less care over her appearance? Savine subtly shifted her new dress in a vain attempt to move a chafing seam away from her damp armpit. She would never have admitted it, but, hell, how she envied her, especially in this heat. Coal is changing the world, she observed, nudging the window down to get a little more air in and swishing her fan a touch faster. I hurt. Is it changing for the better, though? muttered the boy wistfully. That's the question. He glanced up, and a flush spread across his pale cheeks, and his big, sad, frog-like eyes flickered over to Teufel. She gave him the same calm, critical stare she gave Savine, a look that let him judge for himself whether he should have opened his mouth. The lad looked at the floor and folded his arms even tighter about himself. They certainly made an odd couple, the woman of flint and the boy of wax. She not showing a hint of feeling, he with every emotion written right across his face. 
They seemed the very last people one would suspect of being agents of the Inquisition, but Savine supposed that was rather the point. Are you expecting trouble in Valbeck? she asked. If I was, said Vic, I imagine your father would have told you not to come. He did. I ignored him. I hardly think he would be sending you if there was not at least a little trouble there. Am I right? Vic did not even blink. There really was no rattling the woman. Are you expecting trouble? she asked, answering a question with another. I find it's always wise to expect it. I own a share in a textile mill in the city. Among other things. Among other things. I have a partner there, one Colonel Valamir. Once commander of the king's own first regiment, too inflexible to work under Mitrik. Is he flexible enough to work under you? Apparently, Vic not only knew her own business, but everybody else's. Where would be the fun in bending flexible people to your whims? asked Sabine. And partners are useful. Someone to oversee operations, someone to share the risks, someone to take the blame. You should go into business. Not sure I'm ruthless enough. I'll stick with the Inquisition. Savine rewarded that with her exhaustively practiced spontaneous laugh. The mill was losing money. Troubles with the workers, I expect. I always used to say that textiles are for wearing, not investing in. She flicked an infinitesimal speck of dust from the embroidered cuff of her travelling jacket. There are lots of ex-soldiers among the weavers, violent men prone to grudges. When the guilds were broken up, they were left rudderless, injured in their pockets and their pride. What changed your mind? The usual. I realized how much money was to be made, and now, of a sudden, I find my mill is in profit. Which is a wonderful thing, of course, said Lisbeth, who had never had anything worth saying, but could never stop saying it anyway, and to make matters worse, was saying it in an ever more affected accent since she was made temporary companion. At this rate, Savine would have throttled her before they reached Valbeck, let alone by the time Zuri returned from the south. Which is a wonderful thing, said Savine. But profits so fast and so large make me suspicious. You should go into the Inquisition. In this corset? I hardly think so. Now Teufel smiled. Just a little curl at the corner of her mouth, considered like every expression of hers, as though she had been over her budget and decided she could afford one. You don't give much away, do you? said Savine. That smile curled up a little more. Comes from not having much, maybe. It was not mockery, exactly. They simply both knew that Teufel had seen things, suffered things, overcome things that Safine would never have to, would never dare to. She needed no wigs or powder to hide behind. She sat safe in the certainty that she was carved from fire-toughened wood and could break Savine in half with those veined coal miner's hands if she pleased. Savine found she was shifting a little to hide her sword. She wished she had not worn it. How absurd an affectation it seemed, sitting opposite someone who cut people for a living. Vic sat with her legs stretched out. The old niggle in her hip was acting up, and every bump in the road sent a jolt through the carriage and a jab of pain from her knee right to her back. But she wasn't about to squirm for a comfortable position she knew she'd never find. Savine Dan Glockter looked serenely comfortable. One leg carelessly crossed over the other, the shiny toe of one immaculate boot showing beneath the embroidered hem of a dress that probably cost more than the carriage, and the carriage was an expensive one. Vic had never seen a woman who took more trouble about her appearance, and she'd once spent a horrible half-hour lurking at the back of one of Queen Therese's functions. Not a hair of Savine's eyebrows, not a thread of her clothes, not a speck of her powder was out of place, even in the heat. All so porcelain perfect, it was a surprise whenever she moved, talked, breathed like ordinary humans. She wore a ridiculous little sword with jewels on the hilt. She wore a tiny, pointless hat 
fastened with a crystal pin. She fluttered a fan made from fillets of iridescent seashell gracefully back and forth, back and forth. She had a nest of golden braids, which only a dunce could have imagined was her real hair, or anyone's real hair. Had there been any justice in the world, she would have looked absurd. But Vic knew well there was no justice, and she looked spectacular. Might Vic have looked like that herself, if her father hadn't been taken by the Inquisition, if her family hadn't been sent to Angland along with him? Might she have been sitting there, in a wig that took a month to weave, tapping the toe of those wonderful, horrible boots, as smugly satisfied with herself as a cat by the kitchen fire? Vic learned long ago that might have is a game with no winners. Few games do have winners in the end. Do you have those sweets, Lisbeth? asked Savine. Lisbeth, who was only slightly less well-groomed than her mistress, slipped a polished box from her travelling bag. Perfume wafted out as she revealed no more than a dozen little sugared fruits nestling in crushed paper. Vic's mouth flooded with spit. When you've starved, food comes to touch a special place, and you can never quite go back. Can I tempt you? murmured Savine. Vic glanced from her overpriced sweets to her overpriced smile. In the camps, everything had a cost, and usually with painful interest, too. Looking into Savine Dan Glockter's eyes, hard and shiny as the eyes of an expensive doll, Vic doubted you could find a more merciless creditor if you scoured the whole of England. Owing one Glockter was far too many. Not for me. I entirely understand. Can't eat them myself. Savine sighed as she arched her back, pushing one hand into her impossibly slender side. I'm like a weight of sausage meat, squeezed into a half-weight skin already. It wasn't mockery, exactly. They just both knew that Savine had more manners, money, and beauty in one quim hair than Vic could have dug from her whole acquaintance. She sat safe on invisible cushions of power and privilege, knowing she could buy and sell Vic on a whim. Savine offered the box to Tallow. How about you, young man? A blotchy flush spread across his cheeks, as if a goddess had floated from the heavens to offer him eternal life. I... He glanced at Vic. Can I take one? If Lady Savine says you can take one, you can take one. Savine smiled wider than ever. You can take one. He reached out with a trembling hand, prized one from the fancy paper, then sat staring at it. That sweet probably cost more than your shoes, said Vic. Tallow lifted up one dirty boot, its creased tongue hanging out like a thirsty dog's. They were free. Got them off a dead man. And he stuffed the sweet in his mouth. Oh. His eyes went even wider. Oh! He closed them and chewed and melted into his seat. Good, asked Lisbeth. Like sunshine, he mumbled. You really should say thank you. Don't worry. Savine hid it well, but Vic noticed the twitch of annoyance on her face. She offered the box again. You're sure? Not for me said Vic. But you're very kind. I doubt everyone would agree. If everyone agreed, I'd be out of a job. Vic forced herself not to wince as she drew in her outstretched leg and slid the window all the way down. Pull up, she called to the driver. We'll go on foot from here. It's true one must be careful who one is seen with. Savine opened her eyes very wide as the carriage rattled to a halt. My mother likes to tell me a lady's reputation is all she has. Ironic, really. Her reputation is dismal. Sometimes you don't value a thing till you've thrown it away, muttered Vic. Valbeck was hidden behind the hills to the north as she hopped down into the rutted mud, but she could see the smoke from the city's thousands of chimneys spreading on the breeze to make a great dark smudge across the sky. Maybe she could smell it, too. 
just an acrid tickle at the back of her throat. Is that all your luggage? asked Savine, as Tallow dragged their stained bags down from the mass of boxes on the roof. We travel light, said Vic, pulling on her battered coat and giving her shoulders the laborer's hunch that went with it. I envy you that. It sometimes seems I can't leave the house without a dozen trunks and a hat stand. Wealth can be quite a burden, eh? You've no idea, said Savine, as Lisbeth swung the door shut. Thanks for the sweet, my lady, croaked out Tallow. Such wonderful manners deserve a reward, and Savine tossed the box through the window. Tallow gave a little gasp as he caught it, fumbled it, managed to stop it falling, and finally clasped it tight to his chest. Don't know what to say, he breathed. Savine smiled, open and easy, and full of opulently polished pearly teeth. Then silence is probably your best option. It nearly always was, in Vic's opinion. Savine touched her fan to the brim of her perfect little hat. Happy hunting! Fan snapped, whip cracked, and the carriage lurched on towards Valbeck. Tallow watched it go in sad silence, shading his eyes against the midday glare. Vic shook her hair out, stuck her hand in the ditch beside the road, and made sure she combed dirty water through to the ends. You really have to do that, asked Tallow. We're among the desperate now, boy, she said, putting some laborer's gravel in her voice. Need to look like it. And she reached out and smeared mud down his cheek. He sighed as Savine's carriage was lost behind some trees, that fancy box still clasped tight. Never met anyone like her, he whispered. No. Vic slapped some life into her stiff leg, sniffed, hawked, and spat on the road. Then she snapped her fingers at Tallow. Give us one of those sweets, then. Friends Like These the Valamere residence, high on the hill where most of the affluent citizens of Valbeck had their houses, was a lesson in the dangers of excessive wealth and inadequate taste. Everything, furniture, cutlery, and guests most of all, was too weighty, too fancy, too shiny. Mistress Valamere's dress was a misjudged purple, the curtains a garish turquoise, the soup a lurid yellow. The color of urine, with a taste not far removed. I've never known such a hot spell, clucked the lady of the house, fanning herself ever more vigorously. Oppressive, said Superior Rizenau, head of Valbeck's Inquisition, dabbing a dewy sweat from his plump cheeks that instantly sprang back. Even for the season. It was very far from helping that Savine's menses were now in full and particularly brutal first-day flow. Draws like a battlefield, as her mother delighted in saying. Even bundled in a triple napkin, she would not have been at all surprised on getting up to find she had left a great bloody smear across the Valamere's tasteless upholstery. A contribution to the party to live long in the memory. She had to suppress a wince at a particularly sharp pang, set down her over-embellished spoon, and slid her bowl away. "'Not hungry, Lady Savine?' asked Colonel Valamere, peering down from the head of the table. "'Everything is delicious, but alas, as I get older, I must take ever greater pains over my figure.' Rizinau gurgled out a chuckle. "'Not a consideration I'd trouble myself with.' Savine plastered a smile over her disgust as she watched him slurp from his spoon like a hog from a trough. How fortunate for you, and how repugnant for everyone else. Lord Palmholt, the city's mayor, teetered on the verge of slumber. Mistress Valamere pretended not to notice as he drifted towards her in imminent danger of slumping into her lap. The draught from her fan had loosened some strands of grey hair previously plastered across his bald pate, and they now floated from his head to an impressive height. For the tenth time that evening, Savine wished she had stayed in Adua, probably curled up in an aching ball with the curtains closed, 
giving vent to a torrent of obscenities, but she flatly refused to be a slave to her tyrant of a womb. Business came first. Business always came first. And how is business? she asked. Positively booming, said Valamir. The third shed is up and running, and the mill working at full capacity. Costs down, profits up. The very directions for costs and profits that I like. Valamir gave something between a cough and a chuckle. He was a man with a fragile sense of humour. All good news, as I told you in my letter. Nothing to worry about. Oh, I can always find something to keep me awake at night, said Savine, even if it was only a constant grinding ache through her stomach and down the backs of her legs. Perhaps it was her presence, but there was a nervous edge to the gathering. The talk too urgent, the laughter too shrill, the staff twitchy as they whisked the soups away. Savine's eye was caught by the glint of metal at the window, a pair of guards patrolling the grounds. There had been four of them at the door when she arrived, accompanied by a sullen monster of a dog. Are all the armed men really necessary? she asked. She was gratified to note the twitch of dismay on Valamir's face, as if he had sat on a pin. Given your position in society, given the envy that might be directed towards you, given who your father is, I thought we could not be too careful. One can never be too careful, echoed Superior Rizinal, leaning close to touch Savine's shoulder with entirely too much familiarity. But you need have no fear, Lady Savine. Oh, I am not easily intimidated. I receive at least a dozen threats a day, the most vivid fantasies of my degradation and violent murder— Angry competitors, jealous rivals, disgruntled workers, scorned business partners, disappointed suitors. If there was money in threats, I would be— She paused a moment to consider it. Even richer, I suppose. I swear I receive more venom even than my father. It has made me realize there is only one thing men hate more than other men. There was an expectant pause. Which is— asked Mistress Valamir. Women, said Savine, shifting in her uncomfortable chair. If a man was struck in the balls during a fencing match, he would be expected to howl and weep and roll around, while his opponent gave him all the time he needed, and the crowd murmured their sympathy. If, during days of monthly agonies, a woman once let her smile sour, it would be considered a disgrace. She forced her own smile wider while the sweat sprang out of her. I suppose the bars on the windows were installed for my benefit, too. Here on the hill, Mistress Valamir leaned around the nodding mare, picking her words as carefully as mossy stepping stones on the way across a river. We're all obliged to take great care over our security. Three weeks ago, squeaked Condine Dan Sirisk, mousy wife of a mill owner kept away by business. A factory owner was killed, murdered, in his own house. A robbery. Rizinau licked his lips as little purple jellies began to be delivered to the far end of the table. A botched burglary, plain and simple. He leaned across to give Savine a reassuring pat on the forearm, enveloping her in his rose-water and sour sweat scent. We'll ferret out the perpetrators. Don't worry about that. So, there are no breakers in Valbeck. Every face turned towards Savine, then silence, the only movement, the wobbling of those horrible little jellies. Only a few weeks ago, a plot was foiled in Adua to blow up a foundry using Gurkish fire, she went on. Mistress Sirisk pressed a hand to her chest and gasped, less fear at the news by the look of things than near sexual delight at the prospect of sharing it with her entire social circle by noon tomorrow. Savine gave her a conspiratorial wink. I have some contacts in the Inquisition. Well grumbled Valamir, looking rather put out. He appeared to be one of those men who was put out whenever a woman opened her mouth. 
We have no troubles of that kind here in Valbeck. None, frothed Rizanau, dabbing a new sheen of sweat from his forehead. He was quite obviously hiding something. There are no breakers, no burners. Burners? asked Savine. Valamir and his wife exchanged a worried glance. Worse scum even than the breakers, said the master of the house reluctantly. Madmen and fanatics delighting in destruction. The breakers desired, and he wrinkled his lip with disgust, to reorder the union. The burners desire to destroy it. Even if you believe such monsters exist, you will find none here, said Rizanau. The workers of Valbeck are without grievances. In my experience, workers can weave a grievance from the most unpromising thread, said Savine. And you have a vast number of workers here. Can a city grow so fast without troubles? Lord Palmholt jolted awake, possibly as a result of Mistress Valamir's carefully applied elbow. Great strides have been made, Lady Savine, thanks in part to generous loans from the banking house of Valentin Bulk. Recently opened a new branch in the city, you know. He shook himself, then began once more to sag towards slumber. You should visit the new part of town. New streets, said Valamir. Model streets, said Rizinau. Closed in drains said the mayor, rousing himself for another heroic effort, and running water to every house and all manner of innovations. In Gurko they build temples, observed Savine. In Styria, palaces. Here we build drains. There was a round of polite laughter. She glanced up at the maid, just manoeuvring a jelly into place before her with desperate concentration. Might I ask your name, my dear? She blinked at Savine, then at Mistress Valamir, then blushed bright pink and tidied a loose strand of hair behind her ear. May, my lady, May Broad. Tell me, May, do you like Valbeck? Tolerably well, my lady. I'm still getting used to the air. The air can be terribly harsh away from the hill. Worse vapours even than in Adua. May swallowed. So I'm told, my lady. Don't worry, you can speak your mind, said Savine. I insist on it. There's really no point otherwise, is there? Well, my family have a good place on the slope of the hill now, very grateful for it. And what about the old town? May nervously cleared her throat. We were there when we first arrived. The old town's very full, begging your pardon. There are families of six to a cellar. Six to a cellar? Sabine glanced at Valamir, and he gave that wince again. And the walls running with damp, and children playing in the open sewers, and pigs kept in the alleys, and the water from the pumps is far from healthy. She was warming to it now, waving her arms in jerky gestures. More people come in every day, and there isn't work for all of them and prices for everything are high. Her hand caught Savine's glass, sent it teetering. She shot her hand out, as though jabbing with a short steel, and caught it before it fell. The maid stared down in horror. I'm... I'm so sorry. No harm done. Thank you so much. You can go. Foolish, wayward girl, snapped Mistress Valamir the moment she had pulled the over-polished door shut, her fanning turned positively savage. Nonsense, said Savine. It was entirely my fault. Loose hands and a looser tongue. I will let her go in the morning. Savine's voice had a sudden sharpness. I would rather you did not. Mistress Valamir bristled. Pardon me, Lady Savine, but in my own house, a beautiful house in which I am honoured to be a guest, but I asked for honesty. I will not see her punished for it. The pain had quite ground away Savine's patience. She set her smile aside for once and made sure she held Valamir's eye. Please don't make me insist, not when we are having such a lovely evening. If I had been punished every time I spoke truth to an investor, why, I would never have been able to make you so rich. 
There was a long silence. Then Rizinau leaned close to Savine and put his fat, moist hand on hers. It was like having one's fingers smothered in old dough. Lady Savine, I give you my personal guarantee. The workers are content, and there is nothing to worry about. It was his bad luck that this patronizing reassurance coincided with a particularly savage cramp, as if there was a fist clenching around her guts. Savine leaned towards him, cupping her mouth to keep anyone else from hearing, and whispered in his ear, Touch me again, and I will stab you with my fork, in your fat fucking neck. Do you understand? The superior swallowed and carefully peeled his hand from hers. Savine looked back to Valamir. You said business is good at the mill. It is. Then I would very much like to look at the books. I so enjoy the successful ones. Valamir gave that twitch again. I will have them brought to you. Better if I go to them. Having come all this way, I must see the improvements you have made firsthand. A visit in person, ventured Valamir, wincing. Rizanau took up the challenge. It might not be the best. You'll hardly know I'm there. And their wanting her to stay away meant she absolutely had to go. I find, when it comes to business, there is nothing like the personal touch. She took up the absurdly long spoon, delved deep into the jelly, and slurped it through pursed lips with great relish. My compliments, Mistress Valamir, such a delicious jelly. It was a vile jelly, perhaps the worst Savine had ever had the misfortune to consume. She weathered another stab in her belly and presented the gathering with her most glittering smile. You simply must give my maid the recipe. Sinking Ships They ate in an overpriced chop house where the windows were thick with sooty grime and the plates hardly cleaner. Tallow wolfed his meat and gravy down, then watched as Vic ate hers, only just short of drooling like a hungry dog. She didn't like eating with those big, sad eyes on her, but she took time cleaning her plate even so. Another habit from the camps, a habit from never having enough. Relish every mouthful, it feels like it goes further. They waited for dusk, though with the smoke over Valbeck, it wasn't much darker than day and felt even hotter, the sunset an angry, molten metal smear behind the great chimneys they were building in the west. Then they worked their way into the teeming, steaming back streets like rats into a dung heap, asking roundabout questions, trying to winkle out hints of where the breakers might be. Vic had picked over her story a hundred times, picked over Tallow's, too, until the lies were like a second skin, more familiar than the truth. She had an answer for every question, a story for every suspicion, a set of excuses that left her looking good— but not too good. The one thing she hadn't been prepared for was the one thing she found. The breakers, said a boy whore, not even bothering to lower his voice. Expect you'll find a meeting on that little alley off Ramnard Street. He called out to a girl whore, busy arranging the straps of her dress over a bare shoulder dotted with poxmarks. What's the name of that alley where the breakers meet? Don't know that it's got a name and she went back to smiling for the passing trade. All careless, as if the breakers were a sewing circle, rather than a mob of renegades ripping up the fabric of society. Old Styx had called Superior Rizanal a fat man prone to folly, with no imagination but plenty of loyalty. From the careless way folk spoke of treason here, he'd let things get far out of hand in Valbeck. The whores nodded them towards a smirking pimp. After a little bargaining, the pimp pointed out a beggar with one arm. For a few bits, the beggar sent them to an out-of-work smith selling matches from a stall on wheels. The smith nodded them down an alleyway towards an old warehouse. A big man stood outside its door, light from an upstairs window reflected in a pair of round eye lenses that looked tiny on his broad skull. Vic knew right off he could be trouble. 
the size of him, yes, almost a head taller than her, and his threadbare jacket stretched tight over great brawny shoulders. But it was more the look he had when he saw her coming, apologetic almost. None of that peacock strut men who think themselves hard put on, that hint of guilt the really dangerous ones tend to have. She knew it from the mirror on her bad days. And if she'd had any doubts, there was the tattoo on his fist before he'd twisted it up into his sleeve. Axe and lightning crossed over a shattered gatehouse, blue stars on the knuckles, on all the knuckles. So he'd been a ladderman, first up the walls in a siege, front of the storming party. He'd done it five times and lived to tell the tales, or, more likely, to never speak of it again. It was a habit from the camps to think about how she'd bring a man down. This one you'd make sure was on your side, or run away from him fast as you could. Whole thing felt like a trap to Vic, but then everything did, and she told herself that was a good thing. It's the moment you feel safe that you make your last mistake. My name's Vic. This is Tallow. The breakers kept to first names in the main. The big man looked them over, those guilty eyes made small by his lenses. I'm gonna. We've come from Adua. She leaned close to murmur. We were friends of Colum Sibbelt. All right. He looked more puzzled than suspicious, as if it wasn't really his business. Good for you. Aren't you guarding the door? Just came out for some air. Getting too hot for me in there. And he tugged at his collar. That judge woman makes me... He paused, mouth open, like he couldn't quite work out what this judge woman made him. Well, can't say I like the way things are. Wouldn't be here otherwise. But I can't see her making them better. Vic leaned close to him, dropping her voice. Aren't you worried about the Inquisition? Must admit I am, but no one else seems to be. And he nudged the door open with his tattooed hand and offered them the way. Vic didn't speak much, but that was a choice. Actually being lost for words was rare with her. All she could manage as she stepped over the threshold of that warehouse, though, was... Shit. I... Tallow's eyes had gone wider than ever. Shit. Must have been five hundred people crowded close in there. It was hot as an oven and noisy as a slaughterhouse, and it smelled of old tar, unwashed bodies, and rage. It was ill-lit by torches, and the flickering of fire lent everything an edge of madness. Against one wall, someone had unfurled a huge banner made from old bedsheets, the words now or never daubed across it. Some children had climbed up to sit on the high rafters, legs dangling, and for a moment Vic thought they had a row of hanged men below them. Then she saw they were straw dummies with leering painted faces. The king and queen with wooden crowns over their eyes. A bloated Lord Chancellor Gorodets, a twisted Archlector Glockter. The bald one with a stick in his hand, she reckoned must be Byaz, first of the Magi the great and good of government, mocked in the open. They'd drawn up an old wagon to serve as a stage, and a woman stood there now, giving as wild a performance as any actress, one thin hand clutching at the rail while she tore at the air with the other. Judge, Vic reckoned, and she had a sense for theatre. She wore an old scarred breastplate, rusty at the rivets, over a ragged red dress that might once have been some noblewoman's wedding gown. She had a mass of flame-red hair, all braided and coiled, and pinned into a mad tangle. Her eyes bulged, huge in her bony, blotchy face, black and empty, catching the torch flames, so it looked as if she had fire in her skull. Maybe she did at that. The time for talks long past, she screamed in a wild, piercing voice that made Vic wince. Nothing was ever got with talk. Judge let it hang there a moment, head cocked to one side, a brittle smile quivering on her lips. That couldn't be got with fire. Burn them, someone shouted. Burn the mills. Burn the owners. 
burn it all! squealed one of the children from the rafters, so excited she nearly fell, and others took up the chant. Burn it! Burn it! Burn it! Fists punched at the air, tattooed writing on bared forearms, like the rebels in Starrickland used to have. Treasonous slogans proudly on display. Weapons, too, thrust up from the crowd in time with the chanting, and not just workmen's tools sharpened for a show. Pole arms, swords, at least one flat bow. Soldiers' weapons made for killing. What did I tell you? The man called Gunner was standing next to her, shaking his head as he watched Judge prowl the stage, urging the crowd louder. If I'd known it was fancy dress, murmured Vic, I'd have made more effort. She could dig out a smart comment when she had to, but in truth she was way off balance. She'd been expecting the breakers in Valbeck to be a dozen blowhard fools like Greece, hiding in a cellar and arguing over what colour to paint a fine new world that had never come. Instead, she found them armed and organised in numbers, preaching open rebellion. She was off balance, and she wasn't used to it, and her mind raced to catch up. Hold up now! And an old man hauled himself onto the wagon beside Judge. Hold up! That's Malma, said Gunner, leaning down towards Vic's ear. He's a good man. He was Judge's opposite, big and solid and dressed in plain work clothes, face lined from years of labour, and his balding hair iron grey, all ice water calm to her burning fury. You can always find folk keen to start fires, he said, turning to the sweltering warehouse. Finding folk to build in the ashes is harder. Judge folded her arms across her battered breastplate and sneered at Malma down her nose, but the rest of the crowd settled to hear him speak. Everyone's here because they don't care for the way things are, he said. Who could? And Gunner grunted and nodded along. I was born in this city, lived here all my life. You think I like the way it's changed? Think I like the river running with filth or the streets knee-deep in rubbish? With each phrase his voice grew louder, with each phrase an answering grumble swelled from the crowd. Think I like to see good folk put out of work at the whim of some bastards born to privilege? A rights stripped away for the sake of their greed? Good folk treated like cattle? Fuck the owners! screeched Judge, and the crowd cheered and jeered, wailed and grumbled. There's men here turn out miles of cloth a day, but can't afford a shirt for their bucks. Women, whose highest ambition is to con the factory inspector that her son's old enough to work. How many fingers missing here, and hands, and arms? And people held up stumps and crutches and mangled hands, veterans not of battles, but endless shifts at the machinery. There are folk dying of hunger just a mile from the palaces on the hill. Boys who can hardly breathe for the white lung. Girls who catch some owner's fancy and are forced into night work. You know the sort of work I mean. Fuck the owners! screeched Judge again, and the crowd's rage came back louder than ever. There'll be a reckoning. Malma clenched his fists as he glowered at the crowd, his grinding anger every bit as worrying as Judge's stabbing fury. I promise you that. But we need to think. We need to plan. When we spill our blood, and blood'll be spilled, depend on that, we need to make sure it buys us something. And we will. No less than everything. A smooth voice rang out, a cultured voice, and the crowd fell quickly silent. A mood of expectation, people hardly daring to breathe. Judge grinned as she held out her hand to pull someone up onto the wagon. A plump man in a dark, well-tailored suit, soft and pale, oddly out of place in this rough company. Here he is, murmured Gunner, folding his arms. Here who is? whispered Vic, though from that silence she already guessed the answer. The weaver. Friends, called the plump man, stroking gently at the air with his thick fingers. 
brothers and sisters, breakers and burners, honest folk of Valbeck. Some of you know me as superior Rizinau of His Majesty's Inquisition. And he held up his pink palms and gave a sorry smile. For that, I can only apologize. Vic could only stare. If she'd been off balance before, she was knocked on her back now. Fucking shit, she heard Tallow breeze. The rest of you know me as the Weaver. The crowd gave a jagged murmur, part anger, part love, part anticipation, as though they'd come to see a prize fight and the champion had just strutted into the circle. A fat man prone to folly, Glockter had said. No imagination, but plenty of loyalty. For the first time in Vic's memory, it appeared his eminence had made a most serious misjudgment. I wrote to the king a few weeks ago, called Rizinau, laying out our grievances. Anonymously, of course. I did not deem it appropriate to use my given name. Some laughter through the crowd. The ever-dwindling pay, the ever-swelling cost of living, the appalling quality of lodgings, the foul air and water, the sickness, squalor, and hunger, the cheating of workers through false measures and hidden deductions, the oppression of the employers. Fuck the employers, shrieked Judge, spraying spit. Rizinau held up a flapping sheet of paper. This morning I received a reply. Not from his foolish majesty, of course. The cock in the agreement sneered Judge, grabbing hold of her groin to much laughter among the crowd, while the children jumped on the rafters and made the dummy king dance. Not from his Styrian queen, continued Rizinau. The cunt in the palace, screamed Judge, thrusting her hips at the crowd, and someone worked a thread that pulled the dummy queen's skirts up, showing a great fleece muff to gales of merriment. Not from his dissolute son, Prince Orso. Rizinau glanced expectantly over at Judge. She shrugged her bony shoulders. There's nothing to say about that waste of fucking flesh. And a wave of boos and jeering swept the crowd. Not from the figureheads, called Rizinau, but from the pilot of the ship, from old Styx himself, Arch Lector Glockter. The fury at the name was the loudest yet by far. Just ahead, Vic saw an old man with a bent back curl his lip and spit at Glockter's twisted dummy in disgust. He offers no help, you will be surprised to hear. Rizinau peered down at the letter. He cautions against disloyalty and warns of stiff penalties. For his penalties! snarled Judge. He tells me the market must be free to operate. The world must be free to advance. Progress cannot be chained, apparently. Who knew the Archlector was so firmly set against manacles? Some laughter at that. When one man knowingly kills another, they call it murder. When society causes the deaths of thousands, they shrug and call it a fact of life. Growls of agreement, and Rizinau crushed the letter in his fist and tossed it away. The time for talk is done, my friends. No one is listening. No one who counts. The time has come for us to throw off the yoke and stand as free men and women. If they will not give us what we are owed, we must rise up and take it by force. We must bring the great change. Yes, shrieked Judge, and Malmer nodded grimly as men shook their weapons. Rizinau held up his hands for quiet. We will take Valbeck, not to burn the city and he wagged a disappointed finger at Judge, and she stuck her tongue out and spat into the crowd. But to free the city, to give it back to her people, to stand as an example to the rest of the Union. And the audience gave an approving bellow. Wish it was that easy. Gunner slowly shook his head. Doubt it will be. No, muttered Vic. 
She made Tallow wince. She squeezed his arm so hard as she marched him over towards the wall to hiss in his ear. Get out of town now, you hear? Head for Adua. Put— She pressed her purse into his limp hand. Quick as you can, go to my employer. You know who I mean. Tell him what you saw tonight. Tell him— She glanced around, but folk were too busy cheering Rizinau's mad speech to mind her. Tell him who the weaver is. I'm trusting you to get it done. She let him go, but he didn't move, just stared at her with those big eyes that were so like her brother's. You're not coming. Someone has to try to handle this mess. Go! She shoved him away, watched him totter towards the door. Vic wanted to follow, badly. But she had to get to the hill and find Savine Dan Glockter. Maybe there was still time to put out a warning. This must be Victorine Dan Teufel. She froze at that strangely prim voice. I had heard you were in Valbeck. Rizinau came smiling through the crowd, dabbing his shining face with a handkerchief, Judge at one shoulder, Malmer at the other. There was a hollow feeling in Vic's guts as dozens of pairs of hard eyes turned towards her. Like that moment in the mines, in the dark, the day her sister drowned, when she hissed for quiet and heard the water rushing far off. They had her. She was done. Rizinau wagged one plump finger. Gollum Sibbalt told me all about you. Her heart was thudding so hard she could hardly breathe, hardly see. The children had pulled down the dummy of Baez and were beating it with its own staff, straw flying. She couldn't believe how calm her voice sounded, like someone else's, someone who knew exactly what they were doing. Good things, I hope. All good things. He said you were a woman with a hard heart and a level head. A woman as committed to our cause as any. A woman who could keep her wits on a sinking ship. And Rizanow stepped forward and folded her in a smothering hug while she stood there, damp with cold sweat and her flesh creeping. Garlem Sibbalt was a dear friend. Any friend of his is a friend of mine. Judge was staring at her with those black, empty eyes, head dropped to one side. Vic couldn't tell whether she was putting on a hell of an act, or if she really was as mad as she looked. I don't trust this one, she growled. You don't trust anyone, grunted Malma. Yet folks still disappoint me. Rizinau held Vic out at arm's length, smiling. You've come at just the right moment, sister. Why? asked Vic. We are on a sinking ship. By no means. The superior turned revolutionary, threw an arm around her shoulders. We are aboard a ship embarking for shores of prosperity, shores of equality, shores of freedom. A ship headed for a great change. But the voyage will not be easy. At midday tomorrow, our fair city will pass through quite the storm. Yes, my friends, he turned towards the crowded warehouse, throwing up his hands. Tomorrow is the day. And the breakers and burners broke into thunderous applause. Welcome to the Future the spike-topped wall seemed better suited to a prison than a manufactory, and Savine felt far from comfortable stepping through its iron-faced gate. Her monthly agonies had dwindled to a nagging ache, but the summer heat was more oppressive even than yesterday, and her sense of unease had been steadily growing all the way through Valbeck from the hill as her carriage clattered down murky streets strangely empty, oddly quiet, towards the river. The three towering sheds were unlovely buildings of soot-streaked brickwork with few windows and no adornments. Even through the thick-soled boots she had chosen, Savine could feel the cobbles of the yard buzz with the movement of the great machines inside. Men slouched sullen about the yard, loading and unloading wagons, grey-clothed and grey-skinned, hard eyes turned rudely towards the new arrivals. Savine met the stare of one, and he made a great show of spitting. 
She was reminded of the charming reception Queen Therese received on her rare appearances before the commoners. At least no one was screaming, Styrian cunt, at her. But only, she suspected, because she was not Styrian. The workers appear less than delighted by my visit, murmured Savine. Valimir snorted. If there is a way to delight the workers, I have yet to find it. Managing soldiers was considerably more straightforward. One can have perfectly cordial relationships with one's competitors, but rarely with one's employees. Savine glanced over her shoulder at the ten armoured guards, filing through the gate after them, fingers tickling their weapons. It did nothing for her nerves that heavily armed men looked even more nervous than she did. Do we really need such a conspicuous escort? Merely a precaution, said Valimir, as he led Savine, Lisbeth, and the rest of their party across the yard. Superior Rizinal suggested you have a dozen practicals about you at all times. That seems excessive, even for the daughter of the Union's most hated man. I felt their presence would only inflame tensions. In order to make the mill profitable, certain efficiencies have been necessary. Longer hours and shorter breaks, reductions in the budgets for food and living quarters, punishments for talking or whistling. Savine nodded approvingly. Sensible economies. But several of the older hands banded together to oppose them and had to be laid off. There was some violence. It became necessary to forbid any organizing among the workers, though that was made easier by the king's new laws against congregation. Savine's father's new laws, in fact, which she had taken a personal hand in drafting. Then the new methods instituted in our third shed have caused— Valimir frowned towards the newest of the three buildings, longer, lower, and with even narrower windows in its already grubby walls. Considerable ill will. I often find the more effective the method, the more ill will it causes. Perhaps we should begin our tour there. Valimir winced. I am not sure you would be comfortable inside. It is extremely noisy, very warm, not at all a suitable place for a lady of your standing. Oh, come now, Colonel, she said, already striding towards it. On my mother's side, I am from tough common stock. I am aware I knew your uncle. Lord Marshal West. The man had died before she was born, but her mother sometimes spoke of him. If you counted the sentimental platitudes one used about family long in their grave. He once challenged me to a duel, in fact. Really? Her interest piqued by that flash of an honest recollection. Over what? Rash words I have often regretted. You remind me of him, in a way. He was a very driven man, very committed. Valimir glanced towards her as he produced a key and unlocked the door. And he could be quite terrifying. The hum of machinery became a roar as he pushed it wide. Inside, the whole place shook with the endless anger of the engines. The slap of belts, the clatter of cogs, the rattle of shuttles, the shrieking of metal under furious pressure. The manufactory floor was dug deep into the ground, so they stood at a kind of balcony. Savine stepped to the rail, frowning down at the workers, and paused, wondering if there was some trick of perspective. But no. They are children. She let no emotion into her voice at the word. Hundreds of children, lean and filthy, gathered in long rows about the looms, darting among the machines, rolling spindles of yarn as tall as they were, bent under bolts of finished cloth. If Valbeck has one commodity in abundance, shouted Valimir in her ear, it is orphaned and abandoned children, paupers serving only as a burden to the state. Here we provide them with useful occupation. He gave a grim smile. Welcome to the future. In one corner of the shed there were large shelves, five or six high, equipped with sliding ladders, but holding only rags. 
As Savine watched, a tangle-haired girl crawled from one. Their beds, then. They lived in this place. The smell was nauseating, the heat crushing, the noise thunderous, the combination positively hellish. She stifled a cough as she tried to speak again. Even up here on the balcony, the air was heavy with dust, the shafts of light from the narrow windows swarming with moats. Wages are minimal, I imagine. Valamir gave a strange grimace. That is the beauty of this scheme. Aside from a stipend to the poorhouse from which they are acquired, and minimal expenditure on food and clothing, they receive no wages. They can, in effect, be purchased. Purchased. Savine let no emotion enter her voice at that word, either. Like any other piece of machinery. She looked down at her new sword belt. She had been delighted when it was delivered the other day, quite the masterpiece. Siponese leather with gem-studded silver panels showing scenes from the fall of Juvens. How many children could she have bought for the same money? How many had she bought? We used to employ skilled hand-weavers, but in practice there is little need. Children can learn to mind the machines just as quickly, and with one-tenth the fuss. Valamir gestured towards the whirring engines, the little figures crawling around them. Though more the gesture of a judge towards a crime than a showman towards a spectacle. With the improved machinery, plus the lower costs of labour and housing, this shed is more profitable than the other two combined, and far more easily controlled. Valamir nodded down towards a heavy-set foreman patrolling the floor. Behind his back, Savine saw that he held a stick. Or would one describe it as a whip? How long do they work here? She croaked out, over the hand she had unconsciously pressed across her mouth. Shifts of fourteen hours, any longer has proved unsustainable. She had boasted of her toughness, but a few moments in there was enough to make Savine feel dizzy, and she clutched at the rail. Fourteen hours hard labour in that dust and noise, day after day, and hot as the maker's forge, as her father liked to say. She could already feel the sweat tickling at her scalp beneath her wig. Why is it so hot? Any cooler and the yarn becomes sticky. The machines can be fouled. She wondered if so much willful human misery had ever been created in one space before. She put a hand on Valamir's shoulder. When it comes to business, profit is the only right, loss the only wrong. Of course. Something told Savine they both had their doubts. But she could blame him, the bloodless bastard, and he could blame her, the flint-hearted bitch, and no doubt the prophets would lubricate any grinding gears in both their consciences. If they did not make efficiencies, after all, there would always be some other owner whose stomach had been strengthened by failure. Would their workers weep for them when they went out of business, or would they rush to find some new employer to whine their petty grievances at? Well done! she shouted in Valamir's ear, though her voice sounded somewhat strangled. The heat, of course, and the noise, and the dust. I asked you to make a profit, and you have done so, regardless of sentiment. Sentiment is even more dangerous in a mill owner than a soldier. They were cooking something somewhere, and Savine caught a whiff of it, like the food they gave her mother's dogs on the estate. She pressed one hand to her still-aching stomach, but hardly felt it through the bones of her corset. She wondered about her button-and-buckle manufactory in Holstorm, where little fingers were best suited to little tasks. Was it like this? Was it worse? She licked her lips, swallowed sour spit. You might consider improving their conditions, however— Perhaps some separate living quarters could be constructed in the yard, somewhere clean for them to sleep, better food. Valamir raised one brow. Luxury is wasteful, said Savine, but hardship can reduce productivity. In my experience, there is a balance to be struck. With better conditions, you might manage longer shifts after all. 
An interesting suggestion, Lady Sabine. Valamir nodded slowly as he looked down at the children, jaw muscles working. It should have been a heartbreaking spectacle, but there is no room in business for hearts, not ones easily broken anyway. She hitched up the corners of her smile. If I might look over the books now? A great frame occupied the middle of the first and largest shed, a spinning shaft through its centre that brought power from the river via an engineer's nightmare of cogs, gears, cranks, belts, to the great looms that ran in two rows along the floor. A web of thread was reeled in from giant spindles, cloth of different patterns and colours grinding off the rollers. Around the looms the men were gathered, sweat-beaded and grease-smeared, tight-lipped and hard-eyed. If the occupants of the third shed had been apt to break her heart, she imagined the occupants of the first would rather smash her skull. Savine did not expect affection from the workers. She had made her reputation from flagrant displays of wealth, after all, and those tended to sit badly with the poor. But there was something about the way these particular men watched her a cold, quiet focus to their fury, more troubling than any outburst. Rather than too many guards, she began to wonder whether they had brought too few. She touched Lisbeth gently on the elbow. Would you mind stepping outside and bringing the carriage to the gate? The heat had turned Lisbeth's rosy cheeks an angry, blotchy red. Sure we shouldn't leave now, my lady? she muttered, worried eyes darting to the workers. Savine kept blandly smiling. A lady of taste always smiles. Better not to show weakness to our employees or our partners. She was not a woman to be deterred by hatred, not from her workers, not from her rivals, not from the men she bullied, bribed, or blackmailed to get her way. It is when they truly hate you, after all, that you know you have won. So she met the seething dislike with effortless superiority, paraded past with her shoulders back and chin high. If she was to be cast as the villain, so be it. They were always the most interesting characters anyway. Valamir's office was at the very end of the shed, a kind of box up on a frame, with barrels and crates stacked haphazardly beneath, a balcony outside from which an owner might look down upon their employees like a king upon his subjects, or an empress upon her slaves. The colonel bowed stiffly as he offered her the way up. Take as long as you need, he turned to frown at the scores of sullen workmen, though perhaps no longer. The door was fitted with two locks and a heavy bar, so sturdy it was an effort for Savine to swing it shut. She tore open the hook at the collar of her jacket, trying to flap some air onto her sweaty neck, but the atmosphere in the office was hardly less stifling than on the manufactory floor, the nerve-shredding chatter of the machines hardly less oppressive. A loose board groaned under her boot as she made her way to Valamir's desk and its cargo of ledgers. She hated to see anything shoddily made, especially in a building she had helped pay for, but at that moment she had larger worries. She slipped past the desk to the window, one hand rubbing at her throat, where the worry had become an almost painful pressure. The street outside was deserted. All at work, of course. And what but work would bring anyone to this lane of spiked walls and barred gates, of towering mills and rumbling machinery? Yet there was something wrong about the quiet, a weight on the air, like the calm before a thunderstorm. Sabine frowned out at the empty lane, biting at her lip, wondering if she could leave now without— A man slipped around the brick corner of the next mill. Others followed a group of twenty or more, working men in colourless clothes, much like the ones Savine had seen in Holstorm, in Adua, in all the cities of the Union, much like the ones at work below, but moving furtively, as if they were one animal with one purpose. Then she caught a glint of bright steel and became aware, with a strange shiver, that they were all armed. Some carried sticks beside their legs, some heavy tools. 
The leader had what was quite clearly an old sword. He knocked at a gate in the wall. It swung open, as if by prior arrangement, and the men rushed inside. She spun around at a shout from the shed behind her, then more and louder. A commotion even over the roar of the engines. She crept to the door, put a tentative hand to the latch, wanting to open it, fearing to open it. Back! she heard Valamir roar as she eased it open. Back, damn you! The workers had abandoned their tasks and crowded towards that end of the mill, a solid mass of men all facing her, faces twisted with anger, tools, iron bars, and stones gripped in their fists. Her jaw dropped. Valamir's guards were holding them back in a desperate crescent at the bottom of the steps, but they were outnumbered twenty to one. Savine's eyes darted in horror over that ugly swarm, that mob. Valamir stood facing them on the balcony, the back of his neck turning red as he bellowed at them, Step away at once! A man in a stained vest, whose arms looked like they were made from old rope, pointed at Valamir with a club and screamed, You step away, you old fucker! Things began to flicker up from the crowd, thrown stones, thrown tools, thrown bits of machinery, bouncing from the walls of the office, clattering from the guard's armor. Something knocked Valamir's hat off and he sank down, with his hand clapped to his bloody scalp. A bottle shattered next to the door and Savine heaved it shut, dropped the heavy bar and backed into the room. In spite of the stifling heat, she felt cold to her shaved scalp. She had expected an ugly scene on the way out, perhaps, insults hurled and surly men dragged to the cells while she glided back to luxury unruffled. How could she have expected this? An armed insurrection. She could hear her own snatched breath, the breath of a hunted animal. Foolishly, with fumbling fingers, she drew her sword. That was what one was supposed to do when one's life was in danger. Was her life in danger? The noise was louder outside, closer. Over the endless whir of the machinery, she heard screaming, swearing, mindless growling, the clash of steel. A long, high shrieking started, which would not stop. She needed to piss, needed to piss terribly. The sword's grip was slippery in her suddenly sweaty palm. Her eyes darted to the windows, fitted with heavy grates. To the furniture. Nowhere to hide, she would not be found in an instant to the floor, and the loose board. She threw herself onto her knees, prising at the wood with her fingertips, with her polished fingernails. She clenched her teeth as she worked her fingers under the board, heedless of the tearing splinters, worked the point of her sword into the gap, hammering at the pommel with the heel of her hand. Savine jerked her head up at a voice outside. Open the door, darling, syrupy, but with an edge of menace the voice of a slaughterman coaxing a piglet back into the pen. Open the door. We'll be gentle. Make us break it. Maybe we break you too. Rough giggling, and Savine jumped at a blow that made the bar shudder. She hauled at the hilt of her sword, every sinew tensed and trembling. With a squealing complaint, the nails gave, and Savine went sprawling on her back, sword bouncing away, bent across the floor. She scrambled to the hole, a glimpse of the dusty boxes below between two joists, wide enough to wriggle through. She fumbled at the buttons on her jacket, bleeding fingertips leaving red smears on the material, and tore it off. She wrestled the silver buckle of her lovely sword belt open and flung it away. The sword she dropped through the hole, its clatter drowned out by the clattering of the machines. No time for preparations, no time for doubts. She swung her legs into the gap, started to slide through. Far from ladylike, but there is no ladylike way to escape from a gang of killers. I'm gonna count to five, bitch! That voice from outside the door, boiling over with violence now. Five, then we're coming in! Count to a thousand, you cunt! She snarled as she worked her hips into the hole, tight too tight, boards digging at her through her clothes. One. She was stuck fast. 
She clenched her teeth, squirmed desperately, clutched at the joists, and tried to haul herself through. Two! She gave a growl, and with a mighty ripping of cloth, tore through, scraped one shoulder, caught her chin on timber as she fell, flopped down on her side below, head cracking against the rim of a barrel. Three! She heard faintly through the ringing in her ears. She pushed herself up, groggy. She couldn't see, felt a stab of panic, touched a trembling hand to her eyes. Her wig was skewed across them. She ripped it off, threw it down. She was trapped by something. Her torn skirt snagged on a nail head above. She clawed at the laces and slithered free of it, left it hanging behind her. Four! She saw her sword gleaming in the shadows, closed her fist around the grip and started to crawl, keeping low, slithering along in the dust behind the barrels. That unearthly shrieking was still going on, pausing every now and then for a whooping breath, then starting again. Five! She heard the door of the office tremble from a blow, the bar rattle in its brackets. She'd cut her palm somehow, torn two of her fingernails half off, was leaving blood on everything she touched, dabs and smears of it across her petticoats. That would be hell to get out. Hell to get out. She had to get out. She crawled on, head pulsing, shoulder throbbing, jaw aching, hips grazed raw, crawled as fast as she could, tongue pressed into her teeth, crawled, blood tickling at her eyebrow, catching glimpses between the barrels as she went. Valamir being dragged away, bloody head lolling, a worker cackling as he waved the colonel's hat around, impaled on the end of a huge knife. One of the guards lying still, helmet torn off, hair matted, and a dark pool around his broken head. Another on hands and knees, men gathered around, hitting him lazily with sticks which clanged off his dented armor. He stumbled up, putting out a groggy arm to steady himself, was jerked off his feet as his hand was caught between two cogs, dragged into the midst of the machinery. He gave a great high-pitched scream as his arm was crushed, hauled into the gears up to the shoulder, blood spattering his face. Savine felt spots of it on her own cheek, but no one heard her gasp over the noise of the tortured machinery of the tortured man. There was a lurch, a slow grinding, the guard's scream turning to a bubbling wail, then the machinery lurched on, wheels turning. Savine tried not to look. Keep her eyes ahead. This wasn't happening. None of it was happening. How could it be happening? Men were shouting, barking like a pack of dogs. She couldn't make out words, only anger and the shuddering blows on the door above. She followed the main drive shaft with her eyes, saw it disappear through a dark hole in the brickwork on the other side of the looms. Perhaps she could crawl to it in the shadowy, dusty space below the gears. Through there. Perhaps through there. She wriggled under the rollers on her belly. Ambitious as a snake, now she slithered like a snake, like a worm, wet with sweat in the sticky heat, prickling with fear as the frames rattled and whirred around her. She could see a lad through the turning machinery, chink of light across his eager face, but he was staring towards the office, they all were, staring like wolves at the henhouse, waiting for the door to give, so they could drag her out. She crawled on, broken fingernails clutching, on through a great spatter of that guard's blood, on under the great shaft that brought power into the shed, twinkling with grease as it madly spun, dust puffing from the floor with her every whimpering breath. At any moment she expected the delighted scream, There she is! At any moment she expected rough hands to close around her ankle, Bring the bitch out! Her sweating back tingled in anticipation of it. Her chest heaved, coughing and shuddering from the dust as she struggled on, biting her tongue, trying to smother the desperate fear. When she finally reached the hole in the wall, she almost sobbed with relief, clutched at the ragged bricks and dragged herself through, tumbled into a dark passageway, sprawled in ankle-deep water, and took a fetid mouthful, spat it out, retching. The place was dark, 
only a flickering glimmer at the edges of damp bricks, throbbing with the noise of machines, echoing with distorted screams. There was light ahead, a winking light, and she eased towards it, sodden boots slopping and slurping in the mud, the clattering growing louder, something moving up ahead. One of the great water wheels that turned the drive shaft, whirring, creaking, thrashing timbers, light stabbing between the black beams, water foaming as the slats of the wheel plunged into the river, showering spray as they thrust out again in a rain of shining drops. The wheel might have been four times as high as a man. There was no way through it. But between its endlessly moving timbers and the slimy wall of the mill, there was a gap, a gap beyond which she saw muddy daylight, the faintest hint of a shingle beach. She glanced back down the shadowy tunnel. No sign of pursuit. But the door would not hold forever. They would be coming. And if they caught her, could she slide between the wheel and the wall? Was it possible? She pressed her tongue into the roof of her mouth as she tried to judge the gap. What if she did not fit? Would she be dragged under and drowned, dragged into the gears and ripped limb from limb? Would her skull be crushed like a walnut between wheel and supports? Would she be slashed, cut, nipped and nibbled as she struggled to get free, bleeding to death from a hundred wounds while she was spun helplessly over and over and over? She thought of that guard's despairing wail as his arm was crushed by the machinery. But there was no other choice. She pressed herself against the wall, breath shuddering through her teeth with fear and exhaustion, and slowly, by tiny degrees, eased one shoulder around the corner. She lowered one filthy boot into the river, fishing for the bottom, fishing, sodden petticoats clinging to her trembling leg as she eased into the thigh and found mud. She wormed herself on, sticking to the corner, clinging to it with her shoulder blades as if her life depended on it, which it did. She tried desperately, pointlessly to suck herself in, suck herself flat, clutching at the sodden grip of her sword, chewing on her lip with fearsome concentration, sunlight flashing and flickering through the spinning bars. She trusted to her footing on the muddy river bottom, and gradually gradually slipped her other leg in, taking a fistful of her petticoats and dragging them hard against her in case they floated into the wheel and snatched her to her death. Killed by her own clothes fleeing a textile mill. There was a joke there somewhere. She gasped as a bolt sticking proud of the wood caught her chest, ripped some embroidery free, and nearly dragged her into the thrashing timbers of the wheel. She just managed to keep her balance, broken fingernails scrabbling at the crumbling mortar behind her, teeth rattling with terror. She edged sideways, the clammy weight of her sodden petticoats clinging to her legs, water showering her, hardly able to breathe for the rotten acid stink of the river, one cheek scraping the bricks, and her eyes squeezed almost shut, her skull fit to burst with the wheels clatter, hammer, whir, its mindless rage. And with a whimper, she slid free, plunged face down into the river, floundered away, sobbing, gurgling, half swimming and half crawling. She dragged herself up onto wet shingle on quivering hands and knees. For a moment, she wanted to kiss the ground, until she saw the foamy filth that covered it. She looked up, wiping her wet face on the back of one trembling hand. The river slurped past, purple and orange and green, with great blooms of unnatural color from the dye works upstream, bobbing with refuse, churned to stinking froth by dozens of hammering water wheels. On the left bank was a kind of beach, streaked with tide marks of dead brown weed, scattered with the city's flotsam, with rags and skins and broken chairs and splintered glass and rusted wire, and things too far rotted to be identified, all vomited up by the tortured waters and pecked at by flocks of birds, bedraggled to winged rats. A bent-backed woman was picking through the rubbish. She stared at Savine with wild eyes, stared at the sword she still held in one hand, then scuttled away with a bloated sack over one bloated shoulder. 
Savine tottered up the shingle, sodden clothes clinging to her, slapping at her. She had to find something she could hide in. She stumbled along, turning over tree branches draped with rags, plucking up broken boxes, coughing at the stink of watery rot. Flies buzzed near a corpse, pig or sheep or dog, all matted hair and dirty bone. Savine caught sight of something beside it, an old coat, one arm torn off and the lining hanging out, like offal from a carcass, but she seized on it with far greater delight than she might have the latest silks in the clothiers of Adua. Those, after all, would not save her life. This might. Her boots were so caked with dirt, no one could have told they cost more than a house in this neighborhood, but her petticoats, filthy with river scum, heavy as armor with river water, might give her away. She fumbled at the fastenings with bloody fingertips, ended up sawing at them with her bent sword. She was left squatting on that vile river bank in her clinging drawers. Her corset had to stay, ripped open and with one of the bones poking out. There was no way she could reach the laces. She dragged the muddy coat over it, a thing not even the old beggar woman had seen any value in. It stank of rot with a chemical edge that caught in her throat— but she was grateful for it. At least no one could mistake her for that leader of fashion, that scourge of ballroom and parlour, that terror of inventors and investors, Savine Dan Glockter. She wanted nothing more right then than to burrow into the refuse and hide. But they would be coming for her. They knew who she was, who her father was. They would have broken down the office door by now, found the loose board. They would be following her bloody trail, through the machines, past the wheel. Any moment now, they would find her. She scraped muck from the beach, smeared it across her stubbled scalp, down her face. She hunched over, the way the old beachcomber had, dragging one filthy boot behind her. She hardly had to pretend at a limp. She had wrenched her ankle somewhere and it was starting to throb. Everything hurt. She clutched the stinking coat around her, sword tucked out of sight inside, and hobbled away, leaving two hundred marks worth of the finest Gurkish linen slashed and ruined on the shingle. She clambered up a low wall into the lane behind the mill, the lane where she had seen the armed men earlier. She felt something tickle her neck. By the fates, her earrings, the gaudy ones Lisbeth had picked— she plucked them out, was about to fling them away, when she realized what they might be worth. She stuffed them into the torn lining of her corset. The sound of the machines had stopped. Now there was only a faint din of crashing metal, ripping cloth, shattering glass. They were the breakers, after all. They could smash the whole city for all she cared, as long as they left her in one piece. She crept to the corner of the wall peered around it towards the gate of the mill. There was the carriage, looking just the way it had when she got into it that morning, driver sitting with his chin squashed into his scarf, one of the horses tossing its head, harness faintly jingling, all strangely safe and normal in the empty street. With a whimper of relief, she stumbled towards it. The Little People Lisbeth practiced her sitting up straight. She wasn't sure how Lady Savine made her neck look the way she did. She couldn't have more bones in it than anyone else. But Lisbeth had been studying her every spare moment, and she'd get the trick of it. You had to work your shoulder blades back till it felt like they'd touch, then not lift your chin exactly, but sort of lift your whole throat— she slumped back, wriggling her shoulders. Bloody hell, it was hard work. She opened the watch, spent a moment working out what the time was, then snapped it shut with that lovely click. Lady Savine was taking a while, but she'd wait, of course. That's what a lady's companion did. She'd wait until the sun went out if she had to. That's how faithful she was. Better than that brown bitch Zuri, looking down her nose and giving orders to decent people like she was better than them. Well, she wasn't better than Lisbeth, and she'd prove it. 
She'd finally got her chance, and she meant to take it. She straightened one of the very fine lace cuffs on the very fine new dress she was wearing, gave the watch a little pat where it sat above her heart, looking so grand on its beautiful chain. Lisbeth Beach, lady's companion. It just sounded right. She deserved it, more than that bloody Zuri. What kind of a name was that anyway? A name you'd give a doll. Bloody brown witch had everyone convinced she knew best, and now she was bringing her brothers back too. And Lady Savina just said, bring them in, let them live here where the decent folk have to live. Lisbeth couldn't believe it, as if there weren't enough of them in Middleland already. She wanted to be kind. She was a generous person, big-hearted, ask anyone always giving bits to the tramps when she had one spare. But there had to be a limit. Folk in the Union had their own problems, without a crowd of brown bastards flooding in and bringing more. They were everywhere now in Adua. There were places in the city a decent person hardly dared tread. She slipped her little mirror out to check her face. This damn heat was the worst thing for powder. While she was tutting at the colour in her cheeks, she caught a glimpse through the window of some beggar limping up the street, making right for the carriage. Some beggar in a filthy coat with one sleeve missing, scrawny arms sticking out. She thought it might be a woman, and her lip curled with disgust. Filthy she was, stubble hair caked with shit and blood and who knew what else. She looked diseased. The last thing Lisbeth needed when Lady Savine got back was some sick cripple with her hand out. She snapped the window down and snarled, Get the fuck away from here! The beggar woman's red eyes slid sideways, and she veered away from the carriage and hobbled off, hunching down. A moment later, there was a clatter as the door on the other side of the carriage was ripped open. A man ducked in. A big man in worn work clothes with a great smear of soot down the side of his face, barging into Lady Savine's carriage bold as you please. Get out! snapped Lisbeth, furious. But he didn't get out. More men crowded in behind him, leering faces at the windows, dirty hands reaching for her. Help! she shrieked, cringing against the door. Help! and she kicked furiously at the one with the sooty face, caught him a good one on the jaw, but one of the others grabbed her ankle, and they dragged her shrieking right out of the carriage and into the gutter, and all of a sudden it was like she was drowning in a clutching, stomping sea of hands and boots and furious faces. Where is she? Old Styx's daughter! Where's that glocked a bitch? I'm just a face maid! She squealed, no idea what was happening. A robbery, a riot. They dragged the driver down from his seat and were kicking him, kicking him while he huddled on the ground with his bloody hands over his head. We'll give you one chance. I'm just— Someone hit her. The dull thud of it and her head cracked the pavement, blood in her mouth. Someone pulled her up by her hair, rip of stitching. The arm of her jacket was half torn off, lace dangling. Someone was rooting through her bag, flinging the pretty pots of paint and powder away, stomping her brushes into the pavement. Get her inside! We'll soon find out what she knows! No! She squealed, watch chain scraping her face as someone tore it off. No! They were laughing as they started to drag her through the gate. No! She tried to cling to the frame, but one had her left arm, another her right, a third her left ankle. No! Her right shoe kicked helplessly at the ground. Such a nice shoe. She'd been so proud to put it on. I'm just a face maid! She shrieked. Stop! roared Curbman, shoving one man out of his way, then another. Stop! He grabbed one lad, who'd eagerly stuck his hand up the girl's torn skirt, by the throat, and threw him to the ground. Have you forgotten who we are? We're not animals! We're breakers! In that moment, as their maddened faces turned towards him, he had his doubts. But he kept on shouting anyway. What else could he do? We done this so we wouldn't be victims, not so we could make victims of them! 
We're better than that, brothers! And he tore at the air with his hands, trying to make them see. We done this to bring the great change! For justice, remember? He knew better, of course. Some done it for justice, some for vengeance, some for profit, and some for the chance to run riot, and it wasn't like there was no room for a mixture. At a time like this, all flushed with victory and violence, even the better ones could turn dark. Still, there were just enough of the first group to get some doubts going. You thinking to let her go? someone asked. No one's letting anyone go, said Curbman. They'll be judged with the others, judged fair, judged proper. I'm just the face made, gasped the girl, her powder streaked with tears. At that moment, two of the others came out dragging Valamir between them, his clothes torn and his face bloody and his eyes barely open. One of the lads spat on him.